Good afternoon. I thought I should go ahead and, and begin our uh, book reading, so come on in. Uh, step over, climb over. This is informal. You, this is very informal. I thought I needed to start because I saw the sisters over here beginning to bond and get into conversation. I thought I better break this up because you know what happens when we start connecting. Uh, I want to welcome you to our book reading this evening and uh, consider yourself uh, in insider cultural space right now. You have been invited unofficially to the kitchen table, uh, the culture of women. And I want to give a particular uh, thanks to uh, the women who have come from outside of the Denison community as well as one of our own members of the Denison community and one who is in many communities. <laughs> the author of the book has been at Denison for, uh, in a previous life. And man, she's had quite a few of those. Uh, but I also want to welcome anyone who came today because you're interested in this topic. And we have contributors to the book who aren't on our panel. Uh, but who have written pieces for the book. So we'll touch on all those things before we're done today, and we'll still keep a focused uh, approach. But I especially want to thank the students in my Issues in Feminism class because I'm delighted at the conversations we've had this far in the semester. They are talking about womanist thought as if they just live and hang out with black women 24-7. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know how you're doing this. They're telling me about the history of black women and why our feminism might be womanism. And like, so Dr. King, what do you think? I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. So I'm impressed when we can approach each other's lives with such uh, sacred tenderness and be playful about it. And no, we know we don't own it. But we're, no, we're always invited to do that border crossing and that playful, what one scholar calls playful world traveling. So when I see people do that, it gives me hope. That's not a part of my talk. So. <laughs> OK, so uh, we're going to begin with a brief video. It's about three minutes, because I don't know how to break videos up and do fancy stuff. So we're going to start with that. Um, I, um, I wanted to start off, um, again, I want to welcome those who just got here. Uh, I think we should set this up to be informal, certainly my classroom sure is. And so if you want to get up, if you climb through or between someone, grab something to eat, get something to drink. Because uh, this is our little storytelling circle for right now, right? So just, you know, kind of do that thing. If you grew up in a, a, a church, you know how the ushers leave, right? <laughs> Mother-centric aspect of this appreciation is in direct contradiction to the stereotypes that the dominant culture produces about black women. And thus, there is in black communities and culture a consistent presence of honoring mothers and talking back to those stereotypes. Um, there, the other productions of knowledge about black women are also problematic and vexed. Productions such as those that arose from the very damaging 
and far-reaching Moynihan study of 1965 called the Negro Family. And this study, which shaped policies in ways that continue today, portrayed black mothers as pathological and deviant for their roles as heads of households. It painted them as, as bad mothers uh, who were destructive and actually harmed and <coughs> injured their kids psychologically and physically. It painted uh, black women as domineering or matriarchal in their roles as wives and partners. These damaging stereotypes and some of what the literature, particularly that theorized by Mullings and more recently Melissa Harris Perry and, and Hill Collins forever for the, who knows how many years and Bell Hooks and so many others, uh, they call this controlling images because the images are intended to reinscribe ideologies about black women that justify their place at the bottom of the social <coughs> hierarchy of race, class, and gender. So amidst this ongoing production and reproduction of images and representations of black women is the contested space uh, where authors and scholars and artists and leaders and role models uh, and uh, feminist and womanist allies and everyday people uh, formulate another platform to tell the story of black women and black mothers and to create narratives that counter what's called a counter narrative to those dominant culture stories. Um, and this way we resist the oppressive stereotypes that just keep being recycled and recycled and recycled. So Dr. Lovelace's book a collection of sayings of Mamanem enters into and creates a vehicle that easily and without fanfare drives this contested space into the center of our imagination and our reflections on our mother's lives and wisdoms and the many mothers and other mothers that steer women from girlhood to womanhood. So what is distinct about Lovelace's book is that she operated much as an anthropologist by identifying, and I might say one of the best well-dressed anthropologists I've ever seen, but you know, it's so easy for me to digress. My image, and maybe I'm certain it's a stereotype of the anthropologist is not in satin with a statement accessory, but then, but then I need to expand on my way of seeing the world. Uh, but she operated uh, much as an anthropologist by identifying uh, a way to collect the artifacts that actually show us what mother tutelage looks like, sounds like, feels like, tastes like. I noticed how often food was mentioned in the book, but then I do love a good meal. That is, she shows us the linguistic artifacts of the tutelage text itself. The teachings that convey perhaps a lifetime of lessons reminiscent of Oprah Winfrey's, here's what I know for sure. These sayings of Mama Nam are the transport. They're the essence. They're the distilled knowledge. They're the things that the women you're quoting and citing knew for sure that had been passed down the mother line across generations and were held constant in families and communities for safekeeping to be passed on to women today. And this is where the Lovelace book differs from the tributary alone or from the ways in which you find those testimonials to black women throughout black communities such as Tech Nine. Lovelace's collection of sayings implies tribute by making a space for centering on women's wisdom and culture writ large that honors marginalized folk knowledge of women globally. This text is a collection from women and about women. Neither all of the contributors are black women, nor are all of the mothers black women or black American women. Hence, the brilliance of the name Mamanam which is a signifier of black language, is also at the same time a universalizing framework that embraces all of us and that mother line knowledge. So it plays with intersectionality by stating the thesis 
in black American discourse while signifying and showing us through actual contributors' words that Mama Nam is expansive and broadly applicable. No culture would have survived if it had not been for the knowledge it learns to pass on to new generations. And all members of the culture participate in that, fathers and mothers and so forth. But you need the particular of one transmission vehicle to illustrate as artifact. So beyond the title, the text signifies again by inviting a broader audience to the metaphorical and literal kitchen table where women's deep talk happens and women's communal councils are held. Typically, such kitchen table knowledge is shared behind closed doors, woman to woman. But this book, by asking women to contribute who are themselves navigating their worlds and lives in professional spheres, who are credentialed and what many would call high-functioning overachievers, shows us, much like the Denison student, come on now, you see yourselves, I know. <laughs> this shows us both the result of such tutelage and the effect on the recipients without leaving behind the very words of mom and them themselves. Words that play, tumble, challenge, comfort, inspire, correct, and build character, all in the turn of a phrase. Words that humble, and folksy though they be, carry a lifetime of lessons and delivered in the most humanizing and universalizing vehicle of all, folk talk and storytelling. And there's one final, you know, you know academics are long-winded. And there's one final, like, and there's more. <laughs> and there's, I've watched too much TV. And there is one final aspect of this collection that stands out to me in terms of its contribution. This book makes real, at the level of intimacy of women's language and women's culture, what scholars such as myself in my 2011 book on women's leadership, oh, shameless <laughs> plug, and others such as Hill Collins and Annette Henry and Elsa Barkley Brown refer to as the hidden curriculum. This hidden curriculum is the way that women globally and other marginalized identities prepare each other to face the realities of a world that is not structured for their survival, their ascendancy, and their well-being. The hidden curriculum, what Brown calls mothering the mind, is a systematic process that fulfills the womanist agenda to create the conditions by which women can survive injustice, thrive, and bring something back to communities to uplift those in the margin. Therefore, or thereby, trans, uh, transforming society for the good of, and I quote <coughs> Alice Walker, an entire people. With this book, The dialectic, Dialectics of Play that Characterize Black Culture are evident in the seeming contradiction of presenting you with this woman-to-woman -woman tutelage that is both hidden and obscure by the sayings themselves while also being laid before us in full sight. We have the sayings of Mom and Nem, and we are fortunate to have the explanation of the meanings Mom and Nem intended and the proof that those messages landed and achieved their intention by the women who will read their contributions today. They are, if you will, exhibit. The way this panel reading will work is that we'll have four women read their stories, followed by Dr. Lovelace telling us what led her to publish this text and how she brought it into reality. Um, and then we will have a bit of time for Q&A, uh, and we'll have some time for si book signing uh, and the opportunity to purchase the book. So um, our first reader is going to be Rinda Ross. I was raised in Louisiana. Um, my mom is Joanne Berg Ross. It's no surprise that my sister and I were social workers because we were raised by my mom. 
She taught us a very important lesson and led by example to put yourself in their shoes. Mom was a registered nurse and worked with children and people from diverse backgrounds and over the years in different settings. She even spent five years working at a veterinarian's office and uh, needless to say, we acquired more animals uh, during that time. My dad wasn't very happy about it. Uh, my favorite one was a blind chihuahua who uh, my mom said, you can never move the furniture again. And she was right about that. Um, mom was intuitive about children. She was very wise. It's not, it wasn't unusual for her to be captivated by a crying child in a store or to come to rescue a child. Um, she would notice if children were hungry or sick. It wasn't unusual for her to allow my friends to stay with us when they were at odds with their parents. I learned equally important lessons about how people aren't always ready to accept our help. We once came upon a parked car where inside a man was hitting his wife. My mother knocked on the window and told him to stop hitting her. He gets out of the car and he knocked her to the ground. And so I instinctively turned on him, and I'm pretty sure I was in another world at that moment. Uh, I think I might have said something like, I rebuke you, Satan. And his... <laughs> anyway, he hit me to the ground at that point, so I thought maybe I shouldn't try to do an intervention with him. There were no cell phones back then, by the way. Um, so it was pretty dramatic. I was 18, I remember that the next day I was having my wisdom teeth out, and it was just all very stressful. <laughs> He was arrested, um, but my mom arranged with the prosecutor for him to serve jail time on the weekends because she was just very worried that he would need to earn money to support his family during the week. His wife came to see us a couple of times and my mother talked with her often. Pretty soon she stopped showing up and we were pretty sure that she had gone back to the abusive marriage. I use this example um, with my students to teach them about boundaries, self-care, and the timing and method of helping other people. Then as a new mother, I was worried that I wouldn't be as patient and thoughtful in my parenting as my mom. See, I have my dad's personality, but thank God I was raised by my mother because she really taught me how to go with my heart. When I have called her um, about anything regarding parenting during all of the years I raised my children, she was just always so good at being objective, giving advice, framing things in a way that made me take responsibility for my part, but also how to teach them to be responsible and to follow through with their commitments. When my daughter was looking for colleges, you guys might remember these days, there were a lot of discussions and sometimes heated discussions because she wanted to go to a particular university and it wasn't on the list. And I was very, very upset about it. And I called my mom and um, she said to look at it from her perspective. She's assertive, that's a good thing. She thinks of herself as an adult, yet she still has to negotiate significant decisions with us because we're supporting her financially. She said something that was the most important and that I wished, um, maybe she said this to me previously, but I wish I would have heard it a lot earlier in my life. She said, um, you can't please her at the expense of yourself. And that was very, very powerful. It's what I needed to hear and I didn't question myself not one more time after that in dealing with my daughter. So having empathy and setting limits are not mutually exclusive. So put yourself in their shoes is an excellent practice. Solid, solid relationships are characterized by perspective taking, a quality that creates a foundation for success in any situation. I'm a better mother, wife, daughter, friend, social worker, and therapist as a result of my mother's influence and advice. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Lovelace, for letting me participate in this. <laughs> Dr. Hodge. <laughs> a hard head makes a soft butt. I'm Jennifer Faison Hodge. I am the youngest of five children, born to Katie Lee Hardy, Facing. I have two brothers and two sisters. My mother is a strong African American woman and disciplinarian who believed that the sooner her children learned to listen 
and follow directions, the better off we would be. And as quiet as it would, was kept, so would she. When we did not follow mom, mama's instructions or do what we, or do what was right, she would often tell us that we had a hard head. And a hard head made a soft butt. <laughs> Sometimes she would tell us the same thing over and over and over again. And we would still not do what she asked. Mama's response to this blatant disobedience was not counting to 10, putting us in timeout, having a game taken away from us, or being sent to our room without supper. The result simply was a whooping. A whooping in today's vernacular would be one step up from a spanking. This spanking would occur on what mama called the butt. <laughs> so today, we are told to use softer language, such as spanking the bottom or rear end. But for mama, such lang language was not in her vocabulary. I learned very early that I had to do what mama said because I did not want a hard head or a soft butt because of not doing what she said. And I definitely did not want a whooping. So I worked really hard at modeling good behavior. On one occasion in particular, even as a young adult, mama suggested that I take a job that paid less at the County Board of Education instead of a better paying, paying job at a local pickle factory. Of course, I followed her instructions. Over time, I learned the value and insight to mama's wisdom because it helped to shape my long range goals in education. Mama's teachings have informed my personal life as well as how I interact with individuals in my professional life. I hope and pray that my own child and future grandchildren will understand the lessons embedded in the sayings, a hard head makes a soft butt. Certainly, I will be there to help usher in this understanding. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Nicole Pittman. And I guess what I would like for you guys to get from the passage I'm about to read is the idea that nothing is free, right? Um, even things that you get for free, they do come at a cost. Um, my grandmother was born Helen Fuller. She was the true matriarch of our family. I spent many summers with my grandmother, helping her in her garden, playing card games like poker and tunk for money. She was not afraid to take your money. <laughs> Visiting the racetrack to bet on horses, cooking in her kitchen, and helping out at her restaurant. I, along with my younger brother and sister and countless cousins, consider ourselves to be raised by her. We spent summers with her. We lived with her when our parents were going through rough times. As we got older, we even rented apartments from her just so that we could be close to her as she aged. She was our rock because of the wisdom that she shared. It was rare that I got a chance to be alone with her, though. As the oldest child, I was the one who was always trying to be engaged with her, and we would have some pretty rigorous debates. And of all the sayings that I can recall her spouting, you know what this is going to be? I'm, I'm going to make it PG, since we have a, a, some little ones in the room. <laughs> her saying was, if you take a man's money, you got to take a man's stuff. Mess. <laughs> and it's the one, actually, it's the one that has guided my decisions on many occasions because you got to pay the cost to be the boss. Um, the first time I heard this saying was in the context of relationships. My grandmother had been married five times, but she prided herself on never being dependent on a man for money. Her advice was, um, was to always take care of your three basics. I remember her three little bony fingers. 
food, clothing, and shelter. Actually, I wrote that. I can't even remember her three bony fingers waving to and fro as she stated her case. Never allow anyone to provide your three basics for you, baby. Life has taught her that when someone provides these items, they begin to feel superior to you and fail to recognize your worth. In her explanation, she never blamed the provider of those benefits um, for their bad acts. She actually blamed the individual who put themselves in a position of being kept. When we would come to her crying about the treatment that we had received at the hands of a lover, she would say, you thought you were slick. You let him pay all the bills, so now if he takes you for granted or orders you around, what did you expect? She said, don't come complaining to me that you can't afford to leave. You should have left yourself some options. I always tell y'all, if you take a man's money, you got to take a man's mess. <laughs> So another uh, situation where I heard this same uh, saying was in the context of entrepreneurship, because I mentioned she had different businesses. My grandmother was a quintessential entrepreneur. She was born among the cotton fields of Rochelle, Georgia, to a proud family of landowners who traced their property ownership rights to the late 1800s. However, in the 1950s, she found herself in Cleveland, Ohio, married with seven children. Throughout the struggles she faced, she instilled in us an understanding that it is always best to be your own boss. Growing up, I remember working from home as a, her working from home as a seamstress, owning a restaurant, an ice cream store, a video game room, refurbishing real estate for resale or rent, and her first major business was a dry cleaners. She called it the Sutton Brothers Dry Cleaners because she had five sons. Her goal was to provide them with an opportunity to be economically independent. The financial heads of their homes and the examples of strong black manhood who would not be subjected to the whims of the pre-civil rights era employer. As time went on, I went on my way and years later, despite having many degrees, I one day complained to her that I needed daycare assistance for my two boys. And she admonished me with, Start a business from your house, baby. You can watch your own children. Because <laughs> anybody working you is trying to make money off of you. Making money off of you sweating black blood for them. And as long as you begging somebody for their piece of job, they ain't going to treat you right. And ain't nobody ever going to pay you what you're worth. I mean, that hurts even right now, right? <laughs> so as long as you take a man's money, you got to take a man's Grandma Helen is no longer with me, but she instilled in me an understanding that there is dignity and economic independence and autonomy. It is always best to work for yourself. Hello, I'm Nancy Gibson, and I work in the admissions office here at Denison. Um, and so I, again, appreciate um, Dr. Lovelace's um, including me in this wonderful collection of sayings. Um, so, so my saying is a cow needs its tail more than one flat season. <laughs> By Nancy Gibson. So um, at the age of 18, I was introduced to my future husband's mother and grandmother. We were in college at the time, and actually at Capital, there are many Capital connections here, um, and had been dating. Charles, my future husband, lived close to the college he and I attended, and because of his strong family ties, I spent a lot of time with his family. Although African American, I was adopted as a child and raised by white parents. And while my beautiful parents went above and beyond to make sure I had a formidable sense of self-awareness and an understanding of my native culture, there were still many things to which I had not been exposed. Spending time with Charles's family helped to fill in the gaps. My husband's mother goes by the name of Pat and is a widow. His grandmother, Eunice Mombidi Harrington, came to live with them 50 years ago when Charles's father passed. We were married right after I graduated from college and I was thrilled to be a part of their family and to lay claim to both his mother and his grandmother. The term in-law did not apply uh, to them as they openly and graciously accepted me as their daughter. From the very start of our relationship until today, they helped to mold and shape me into a strong black woman and leader. 
From the tips they gave me on how to comport myself as a young lady, to how to care for my hair, coupled with how to deal with people and parenting, have been invaluable in ensuring that I had the necessary tools in my toolbox for personal and professional growth. When Mom Beattie was a young girl, she remembered her grandmother Trout, who was a slave, always saying, a cow needs its tail more than one fly season. As far as I know, this saying has been passed down at least five generations. I heard it spoken from the, the first time I met Pat and Mom Beattie as a teenager. The saying was a way to show me that there will always be a time when people you care about may push you away or turn their backs on you. But more often than not, they will come to realize that they need you. These two strong women successfully raised Charles and his brothers to be strong, independent, smart black men who always had been there for their families. Pat and Mom Beattie demonstrated faith in God, that faith in God was their foundation for how they would shape their family. Mom Beattie recently passed away at the age of 99, just two months from her 100th birthday. We will never forget her wonderful words of advice and will always cherish the time we had with her. As a reminder that Mombiti's sayings live on, our daughter Vanessa, now in college, now graduated from college, uh, will easily rattle off this family saying and many more as she encounters difficult people and situations. We take comfort in knowing that the legacy and strength of these two women and of women who preceded her and the, the Beattie family will continue to live in the Gibson family. Thanks. say that I am beyond thrilled. The question was asked, how did you do this? What brought you to this particular book, a collection of sayings of Mama Nim? It happened more than 25 years ago. Momentary pause. Any idea that you have if it's meant to unfold, it doesn't matter the amount of time it takes. It will be brought to fruition. So this idea had to be birth. More than 25 years ago, as Gloria Long and I would make our sojourn from Columbus to Fayetteville, North Carolina, to do some work at Fayetteville State University with students. We would ride and we would begin to share and before long we would slip into the rhythm of cultural aspiration and inspiration by saying, girl, <laughs> when mom and them found out and girl, you better know that the neighbor was always watching. So we slipped into that rhythm, and as we made the 10-hour sojourn from Columbus to Fayetteville, we found ourselves with a lot of commonalities around sayings. There may have been a tinge of difference, but that difference was so minute that if she would begin the saying, I could end the saying, because it didn't matter there is one community. You may have been reared in another state. You may have been reared across town. It didn't matter. Mama and them went to the same school and they shared information without cell phone, without telephone, unless it was a party line. And none of you in here remember the party line, <laughs> except for maybe Jennifer, do you remember the party line? Okay, so do it. does anyone know what a party line is? Okay, so you see the marked difference between generations, which is part of this whole mama them aspect. It is intergenerational, but let me not run forward without telling you what the party line is. In the community, there was a phone. Everybody had a phone, but everybody shared the same line within the community. And in order to get your time on the call, if somebody was long-winded, you would simply pick up the phone after eavesdropping, and you would <laughs> hit the button to press it down a couple of times so that the other person would know that you wanted to make a call. Or you would simply interrupt and say, I have a call that I would like to make. 
So Mom and them might have used the party line for some of this, but I highly doubt it, because it was intuitive. They knew intuitively what their child, whether it was a biological or surrogate child, needed to know in order to be successful, in order to make it. And success not necessarily in terms of making and accumulating money, but success in the terms of making the essence of who you are whole. So mom and them poured into you. Sometimes it was a look, because my mother could sit in church and she was cross-eyed, and you never know when the, where those eyes were going, but it didn't matter. You might have thought she was looking in your direction, and so you corrected yourself. <laughs> but she would sit in church and simply give you that look. You knew to straighten up. You didn't question, well, it, it, what did she mean by that? You knew what she meant by that. Or, as I did, my son, when I was sitting in the choir stand one Sunday, and I looked out and I saw him misbehaving, I simply moved from the choir, walked down to where he was, got him by the hand, brought him up to the front of the church, and sat him with the deacons. <laughs> Didn't have to say anything. Mama and them sometimes said all that they needed to say by doing. And so the question, why this book? That's how it started 25 years ago with the declaration that one day we would write this book. Time did not present itself until 2014. And then it hit me. There is this book that needs to be birthed. And it needs to be done now. Had I done it 25 years earlier, it would not have included the women nor the message that it now includes because I would have been writing the book. I would have authored the book. But by including these women, the beauty, the brilliance, the wealth of information is that 37 women present 37 sayings and expound on those sayings by sharing the meanings of them and also talk about collectively how those sayings will be passed on to the next generation. Now, I too spent most of my life in the academy, my adult life. In addition to that, I am a minister. And if any of you, and in addition to that, I'm a Baptist minister and we can be long-winded, so I have some notes so that I'm not <laughs> long-winded. So these 37 women, as we worked together, I sent out information to some that I knew, and then they passed information on. Isn't there something about sayings in that? The passing on. They passed on the invitation, and other women got involved in it. And so we ended up with 37. Just a little information. The 37 women at the time the book was, the idea went out. Uh, was bet were between the ages of 37 and 79. Those 37 women, while there were a number of themes that emerged, there were prominent themes, family, God, and the support provided by their mamas, their madias, and other mothers to usher them and their daughters forward. Because when mama and them spoke, you couldn't help but listen. You might have given off an attitude that you weren't listening, but mom and them could pick up on that as well, and they dealt with it sufficiently. The women have been careful to pass these sayings on to their own children, to their own daughters, but also to other daughters. There was a spoken as well as an unspoken strength, a resiliency that mom and them engaged in. And they did it out of dignity. Anything that they said was for you to improve. So they poured into us. The socioeconomic status of these women were not a deterrent to what they passed on. Many of them did not have college degrees. Many of them may have gone as far as the seventh or eighth grade if they finished high school at all. But there was something about their need to pour into the community, 
to help shape and build the community so that the community, meaning the larger community, because mama didn't care what your ethnic racial makeup was. If mama walked the street, my grandmother in particular, if she walked the road and she saw someone acting out, she was going to address that. Didn't matter whose child you were, didn't matter who you were. So those are some of the things that I gathered as I read the sayings time and again, and the importance of paying attention to these unsung sheroes. That, to me, was critical to our ability to keep the sayings moving forward so that everybody in here, as you think about sayings, in fact, let me just share with you that Mom and them took a Mediterranean cruise in June, yes, on a ship, Spain, where else did we go, honey? Italy. Barcelona. That's my husband over there. His name, his name is Honey. Last name is Ross. <laughs> so Mama and them took a Mediterranean cruise. And while sitting around the dinner table with individuals I didn't know, I started talking about the sayings. And before long, there was a rhythm that had been collected. And we're sitting at the table with people who don't even look like us. But you know what? The experiences have been the same. Across cultures, across generations, it didn't matter. And so we talked about sayings and they added their own. And so one of the things I want you to have as a takeaway from this is that there are some sayings in your own community. What I'm encouraging you to do is to begin tapping into those sayings. Those sayings are like a balm in Gilead. Those sayings will not only keep you when you feel like the earth beneath you is crushing, when you feel as if there's something that has transpired on the job and you're wondering where a source of strength is going to come from, all you got to do is lean back and say, well, mama said there'd be days like this. <laughs> and there it is. There is something there. So that's what I leave you with in terms of how the idea was conceptualized, but more importantly in terms of how the idea moved from concept to reality, and it moved from concept to reality because Nicole Pittman, because Nancy Gibson, because Renda Ross, and because Jennifer Hodge were in instrumental in that. And we have others. We have Pastor Charlene, who's here, who was instrumental. We have Linda Crumholz, who was instrumental in sharing a saying. And we have about 30, two other women who were instrumental, and all for the taking for you to get it, to act on it, and to go back home or, and ask your own mom and grandmom and auntie and whomever, what saying did you grow up with? Share it with me now so that I can have that because it creates a nugget that's worth holding on to. Thank you. And thanks to Tony for, and Nancy for hosting this. Thank you to my wonderful husband who, who drove from North Carolina. When was it yesterday, honey? <laughs> and we brought 415 jars, I know my time is up, 415 jars of peanut butter down the highway because I have a, a, a friend at my home church, Mount Olivet Baptist Church, who collects peanut butter for Haiti. So I sent out a peanut butter drive notice. I'm collecting peanut butter. So I got peanut butter from Hartford, Connecticut. I got peanut butter from Columbus, Ohio, and we collected in North Carolina. And so we packed it up and we brought it here yesterday and we delivered it to Mrs. Peggy, Peggy uh, Burke for Haiti. So it's things like that, because mama said if you got and somebody else need. Mama said, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And when you start to do that, you'll start to do things that you never thought you would do. 